Hi everyone. Hmm. Are you in for some fun? Let's have some fun, shall we? Okay, a bit about me first. Uh, I'm Victor. I speak Java. Although, of course, with the years I had to learn other languages as well. Um, back at work, they call me a lead architect at IBM, but please don't believe I'm sitting there in the corner office drawing Visio diagrams on the wall. That's not me. I'm actually leading the most difficult pro uh, pardon me, challenging projects we have. Uh, and uh, basically, that's me uh, helping everyone on the floor or maybe in the entire building to solve any kind of problem related to Java. And you, get to see, and you can understand I get to see all sorts of really nasty issues. And I love that. I'm one of those guys, those strange guys, who still use those lost extreme programming practices, like pair programming, aggressive continuous refactoring, and test-driven test development. I'm a weird guy back home. Now, um, I still, love, in the community side, let's say, um, I'm one of the key contributors in the local Java user group back home in Bucharest. And I also started recently the Bucharest Software Craftsmanship Community, aimed to inject passion in developers and help build a technical culture in a company. Because in my opinion, this is the most important goal. If you manage to empower, to, 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 to help, to promote, to, 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 to gain your developers on your side, then your company will be good. Your company will just be fine. Now, um, I like clean codes. I'm really into this clean code stuff. And I've talked about clean code in so many conferences and cities and countries all over the world. And everywhere I went, I found the same passion, enthusiasm about how to write well-crafted code, code that is easy to understand, easy to maintain, a pleasure to work with. You can find the selection of my talks here on my website. But just tell me one thing. How many of you have more than eight years of experience? Raise your hand. More than eight years. Oh, I love you guys. All of you guys should be training, teaching, coaching the younger, the junior that, come, that comes uh, to our profession. It is our moral duty as a, as, a, as a professional to help the younger grow. And I have done just that five years ago. I've started, of course, with internal trainings. And over the, fast, over the past five years, I've trained more than 1,000 developers in more than 100 training days on challenging co companies. Initially, of course, I start with simple topics. I know, frameworks, libraries, basic stuff. But then I moved on to more advanced, agnostic topics. I teach design patterns in my, you know, my local university for the, fast, for the past four years. And clean code, unit testing. I'm also into Java performance and Scala. But you see, when I come to a company, besides just teaching what, what I'm supposed to be teaching, I'm, I also try to build this culture that I've mentioned, this technical culture, this, to inject passion into developers, because this is the ultimate, if you reach that, no, you will have no more problems, really. So if you want to see things, if you want to hear my thoughts, if you want to see nice metaphors, quality stuff, do follow me on LinkedIn on Twitter. But enough about me. <laughs> Let's, this is a top conference, right? So we should turn on this switch. Yes, of course, we should turn on the hardcore switch. And we should code. Hint, you can lower the play rate in YouTube afterwards, right? You know that. Good. So, just to warm up a simple stuff, I would like to get this list of users to the, into the, to the interface. So, for that purpose, I will build the user facade, which has this user repository dependency. Then I have public list of user DTOs. I'm returning this to the user, to the user interface. Get all users. I will first get the users from the, from the repository. Then I will create the list of DTOs. Then I will iterate over all the entities in my list. I will create a DTO for each of them. And I will just, just set username to be the same as the username in the, in the entity. The full name is first name plus last name, uppercase, of course. And then it's active in case it was not yet deactivation equals null. And then I will add to a list, and I will return the list, and I'm done. But this is not the thing. This is not something I'm very proud of. This kind of code I will write over and over again in, in so many situations. And every time I will write this stuff over and over again. This stuff. The only thing that matters is these particular lines. These particular lines is what really matter. So what I will do, I will just extract them as two DTOs to DTO, DTO. And then um, I will say merciless, I will just return. Of course, this is warm up, right? Stream, and then map, and then this, four dots to DTO. No, no issues about that. Collect to list. To, oops, no, not that one. To list, thank you. 
And there you go. This is the one liner that you should write instead. Note, however, that I don't want to inline this I, I don't want to, to have this, this huge lambda here. Right? I could type this. But this is very, very, very ugly. Right? So whenever you have a big lambda that starts with this, do extract a function like I just did here. But in certain situations like this, for example, this mapping is so easy that I can even push inside the constructor of the DTO. This is a bit weird, but DTOs are allowed to depend on entities, not the other way around. So look at what I will do. I will just, uh, come on. OK, and then do this. And there you go. Yes, we also have a sort of A of Alt J, as, as you want. So this is it. By the way, I'm using Eclipse. Sorry. <laughs> OK, uh, and then uh, this will result to uh, DT user DTO four dots new very nicely, and I don't long I no longer need this. However, if this mapping grows too big, or if at some point requires something like let's say auto wired, perhaps some private other dependency, right? If it needs another component to do to do its stuff, right? To call some method on that dependency, this will never work. No matter how much the DDD guys would want to inject components inside a in, uh, data object, this, this won't ever work. So I will just remove that. I will come back to the previous solution very nicely. Here it is. Come on. Control Z. Do you know what, what Control Z comes from? Control Zorro. <laughs> it takes a lot of strength, emotional strength, to just revert your work and try again. But this is something you need to, to do at times. You need to be prepared. But again, this is growing too big, and I want it out of my eyes. That, that's why I will obviously create a class, user mapper, in which I will just move this method after I make it public to be able to call it. OK, I will just fake that I put here a component. This won't ever run in this speed, you can imagine. But the point is, I will then be able to auto-wire the private user mapper, mapper, uh, mapper, mapper, thank you, mapper, and then say mapper for dots this DTO. This will work just fine. So I've just pulled this, this mapping out in an instance object. This other instance object managed by, I don't know, Spring, for example, would be able to use other dependencies in turn to do its stuff. OK? So ways to hide those logic, that, 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 that bit of logic. You can put it in a method inside the same class, in another, in an, in an item class, in a static method, in another instance class, in another as a method, in, as an instance method of another class, and so on. But this was just warm up, right? And at times you may get too warmed up. You might even write such things. Oh yeah, you, this guy implemented one use case with one single chain of streams. This guy should be hanged, for Christ's sake. So uh, the worst thing you could do after you collect is to stream again. This is evil. This is despicable. You should never do that, right? So for a minimum, but I won't refactor this. I will just point out that this should be replaced with a method, with a helper, let's say synthetic getter, I like to call them, which is, would be named is not deleted in order to be able to use the for dot notation very nicely about that. But again, it's too boring to refactor this, and time is not uh, too long today. So I would like instead to focus on the most frequent bug in the world. <laughs> The null pointer exception, which wasn't all, I mean, null wasn't always there, right? Let's talk about the billion dollar mistake of Sir Charles Anton Richard, who invented null. Okay, so let's, yeah, dive into it. I want to build a discount service which will return a string, get discount line for a customer. This will return the discount percentage to be get discount percentage of this customer get member card. Then in the private integer, get discount percentage of member card. I will, if I got fidelity points more than 100, for example, I will return 5% reduction. If the fidelity points are more than 50, I will return 3% reduction. Otherwise, nada, nothing, null. And I want to test all this for 60, for 10, and for no member card. Nice. So the first thing I want to do to test this method is to instantiate this new D. Ouch. Discount service, of course, which will be something like this. And then I will sys out and I will say service dot get discount line of a new customer with a new member card of uh, 60, right? 60 points. And I will run this as a, as, a, as, a, as a class and then I will see three. Why three? Because I fell in between those and actually I got here. So this is a three I see right there. 
nice, this is fine, but what would happen in case I only have 10%, I mean, 10 fidelity points? Let me see what happens. Oh, you dis just displayed the null to your user. Congratulations, his trust in you will fail, will decrease, right? So, this count percentage should, a null should not be printed. And you panic, of course, it's a null. Oh my God, what can I do? And what do you do? You look, where does this null come from? It is this concatenation. This null here gave us problems. Oh, then what can I do? You all know, right? This is the end. If <laughs> D is not null, we all done that. Right? We've all done that many times. Many, many times. And otherwise, return the beloved empty string. There you go. This should, this should fix it. But then you walk to your open space and you hear some people there in a corner saying that each time um, null gives you trouble, you should consider an optional. And you are curious about this option and you jump on it and you say, okay, how can I use this option? What is this option? It is a box which may contain something or not. Well, where this problem really, really comes from is that this, this function returns a null that is unexpected by who calls that function. So instead of just shamelessly returning a null, I will return an optional of integer. This will be an optional empty, and this will be an optional of three. This will be an optional of five. And then this will, be, will give me back an optional of integer. So what I do here is very easy, right? D is present. If it's present, I, I concatenate, right? That's it. I mean, what the heck? It's easy. Oh, wait. Optional of three. Why? Because you see, D is now an optional of integer. So I need to do get. Good. But then this isn't very different from the previous solution, right? I mean, we still have that if there. So that with optional, whenever you use optional, you should start with the optional. What I mean by that is do D and then map, and then in case there is a discount inside, I want to prepend it with this stuff, like this. Very nicely, return. And then in case there was nothing in the box, or else, empty string. And there we go, no more ifs. Very nicely and cleanly, I get this, ah, it's a clash here, right? This is the optional, let's say, but the, it will have a short, short, short life, because as soon as that, I, was in, I will inline it, of course. I will say map, and then or else. Very nicely. And I, I got rid of the problem without using any ifs, which is good. Then, then you start working on the third use case, in case a customer doesn't have any member card whatsoever, nothing. If, and if you run this, you will see Sir Charles Anton Richard here with us today. Null pointer exception. And whenever you see a null pointer exception, the first impression I see in people is panic. Oh my God, oh my God. Oh, shame on me, I have a bug. Don't do that. Don't ever do that. Always use the bugs and the stack traces you get as a way to improve your skills. Because in this case, the first thing a normal developer does is, oh my god, click here. Where is this null coming from? Here. Oh, okay. So rapidly, rapidly, if, if card is null, oh my god, let's wash the shame away. Return. Empty. But this will just add one more responsibility to the, to the same pile of responsibilities. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. Instead, you should all again think about the optional. <laughs> so now th this comes the question, where this, this null come came from, actually? It was this place, right? This getter got me a null, which I then crashed here with null pointer exception. <laughs> so instead of, so basically the null surprised me when it came from here. So look what I will do. I will have the courage to touch on holy things. Like getters in the entities, oh my god, what is he doing? How, how does he dare to mess with the auto-generated getters and setters? Oh my god, can we have logic in the getters and setters? Yes, you can. So then, the point is here, it, this will give me an optional. Now, what I will do next is use the IDE-driven development. Do you know how IDE-driven development works? You press in, the, in your, of course, IntelliJ, Alt, Enter, Enter. I will press this. There you go, I have an optional inside, right? Yeah, so what do I do, what I do here? It's very easy, right? If it's not present, I will return empty. But again, this didn't save me anything. I still have that if. So, again, whenever this happens, you should start with the optional. 
How did we do just now? We started with the optional, and in case there was something inside, we prepended something. So again, we should start with this, which, which is now an optional. Oh my God, it's an optional. So we should start with this. Let's do this. And in case there is a card, so map, in case there is a card, I will get discount percentage out of map. But I did a mistake. I did a mistake. I forgot to do what? I forgot to do Zoro. So, again, now really think of it afterwards. How much pain it, it takes some, uh, sometimes to change the thing that you created. It's very, 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 very painful at times. So really what will end up here, it's something, like, I think, like that, right? Uh, it, I will start from a uh, customer or get member card, something like that. Good. Now, this will ensure no null card will enter here, so I can get rid of this one very nicely. And now if I run, everything works fine, right? Almost. Because you see what I did? When I, if I, if I do this, wait a second, yet. In the, this D is now an optional of integer. Again, it happened before. But the problem comes that this map will return me, you know, when you buy your, your your, 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 your kid a present and you wrap it in two wrappings, right? For Christmas, to, 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 to increase the thrill of discovery. This just happened to us. Without talking about monads, without talking about anything nasty, that's for Christmas story time, I will just flat map and I will say it works. We will all be happy and we will move on to the next example. Okay. So. The next one is nice. The next one is really powerful. It's actually one of the most useful design patterns, I would dare to say, in functional programming that we can use, we, the mortals, in our Java. So, what, uh, let's start this one. I will be the order, uh, order repository which extends GPA repository of order and long. This will, this is of course spring data. Stream order find by active true, and then I will build an order exporter which has this dependency to order repository. Public file export file with a given file name. The first thing I will do is to create a file in the correct folder. All right, good stuff. And then I will try open a writer file writer on that file, and I will write the ID and the header, and then I will find by active true, getting all the <coughs> orders. I will map, transforming each of them in the lovely CSV line, right? Oh, get creation date, right? And then for each writer, right? In case, I will then return the file. Now, in case something goes wrong, I will be make sure to send an email, log the error very careful. This is terror-driven development. And then throw it again. <laughs> yes, throw it again. You log it, just to be sure no one, uh, no one forgets to log it, right? This is a sign of distrust in, uh, in the other developers, in your teammates. Okay, there are several things that don't compile yet. Like, uh, let's use the log Lombok, right? C, how is it called? C, L, C, 4, G, something like that. Good. And then this causes problems. Why? Because you see, writer, writer, this write method throws a lovely exception back at, back at us. An exception which is not expected by the consumer, which is taken by this for each. This happens very often when you have methods which throw checked exception. You can again use the IDE-driven development approach, but this is not something you'd like to see in your code. This is ugly, okay? Wow, what the heck was, just happened? It was so nice before. So, there are ways, other ways to do it. You can either write your own function to do that a conversion of an exception to a runtime, or you can use Joul for that. Unchecked dot consumer that will get a, con a checked consumer that will get. Then this really deserves a bit of attention. This this beauty takes a checked consumer, which is a consumer that can throw whatever it wants, and gives you back a consumer. What does it do? Is it actually it wraps that checked exception into a runtime one and throws that back at you. This is something you don't want to show to your children. It is a function that takes a function and returns back another function. It is near the apocalypse. This is, this is whoa, what the heck, right? This is something you will get really comfortable with after six or nine months of actively working with Java 8, in my experience at least. Good, but then, okay, you need to throw, throw yourself, okay. And then let's see what, what, what will happen now. Comes the change request. Now comes the change request, of course, of course. The change request says that I want also to export the, the users. Let's say user repo, user uh, repo. What would you do? So, we will use now the oldest design pattern in the world. Oldest, which is, of course, copy-paste programming. 
I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And then just export a user file, and then I will do something like username. Oops, username. And then suppose I, I search the user repo here. I will find all, perhaps, and then I will map from the user taking its get username. Something, something silly, right? Come on. What doesn't work? Ah, stream, of course, stream. And then you get a uh, username. Yes, it's, an, it's enough for the sake of demonstration. But the point is here. I had to touch on three lines. Three lines. What I do next is this. I comment out the... But I often really do that. I copy-paste to see how much code I need to change. I take that thing that I had to change. Right? The other thing is precisely the same infrastructural code that I want to reuse. And then I will apply an old, an old principle, which means to extract and replace, actually. This, actually, this bit of code is the thing that I want to replace in certain situations. So the first thing I would like to do is to make it a method. Let's name it write content. This write content method is now writing, writing what the heck are these? Uh, orders, thank you. Then, look what some people imagined they wanted to do. Now, to pay attention. Class. <laughs> Hacking time. And now pay attention. What is he doing? Why? Why? Protected is an anti-word. an anti -word. I mean, let's... Uh, this will extend. Oh my god. Extend. He's using the E word. Oh my god. Order exporter. Good. And then I will just hack. This is hacking. How many of you are hackers here? Oh, you're not allowed to say that, right? But this is hacking. Yeah. And I need also to get the order repository here. But you see, if you, but this works. This really works. You will instantiate this and you will write the users. You will instantiate this, you will, you will write the orders. But this is evil. People were burned for this. People were fired. They were murders, passionate murders about this. Because you will just read on this file, very comfortable, you will see that this method is being called. And you should support, you should know. IntelliJ displays a little eye here, right? Where are you? Come on. Displays a little eye here. Saying, okay, this method is being, is being uh, subclassed, it is being overridden. But if you don't pay attention, if you are, I don't know, you might not figure out that this call really doesn't go there, but goes there in another file, for Christ's sake. So this is pe people rapidly realize how big a mistake this was, and what they did instead is to leave that method abstract. So if a method is abstract, it's obviously that there is no implementation, so you have to search for one, right? And then you, we can have a class which is user exporter for exporter. I think I have a clash, right? No, this is order exporter. And then I don't know what. We will rename it afterwards. This, I, I also do that a lot. Uh, and if you spend more than five seconds finding a name for a class, put something like that. If you are just developing it, it will take seconds to rename it afterwards. But just the point to have this here. This is abstract very nicely. OK, and I am overriding actually the right content. I am providing the implementation, really. Do any of you know what the name of this design pattern? Come on. It is the template method, in which you have an algorithm, a, a big pile of code, in which at a certain point you want to call one logic or another logic. And you provide the missing logic using, over, using extension, using abstract methods that get overridden, implemented in subclasses. This is a way to provide the missing logic using the E word. I forgot to put the E word. Sorry. Order exporter. Now, um, this will work. And let's write some code, right? So. Class, client, code, code, and then we have a main here, in which if I instantiate, how is this called? This is actually just the exporter right now, and this is the, let's name it uh, order exporter, it was a good name, and this is user exporter right now, user ex exporter, good. Now, if I want to ex export orders, I will simply instantiate new order exporter. No issues about that, very easy. And then exp export the file, export the file named order uh, CSV. Good. And in case I want to export the users, I will obviously um, in instantiate the other one. No, no, nothing fancy here. But then, 
Then comes the Java 8 time. Then comes the functional programming age. But not age. I'm not against OOP, folks. But uh, sometimes functional programming really simplifies the thing. What you really wanted to do this is to execute arbitrary bits of logic in this particular location. And to do that, you use the E word. The extends word, right? But I have really an issue with, 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 with extends. So to avoid that, look what, what we can do. We can say, oh, OK, so what you really needed here to run is something which will write to a writer. Its signature is a function which returns void and takes a writer. It is a consumer, really. So I will take this as a parameter. It's a consumer of a writer which is something like, I don't know, content writer, for example. And this content writer I will use here, and I will pass the writer in. This particular functionality that I have here will do its stuff. I no longer need to extend anything. These are no longer exporters, really. These are order export content writer, perhaps even better. Uh, export content writer. Good. Now, I need to instantiate both of them, but I also need to instantiate uh, exporter. Of course, I will never instantiate this in real life. I will use some Spring to do that for me. But just for sake of fun, let's work without Spring here. Exporter equals. And then when I will call exporter.export file, I will pass the file name that I need to use. Ah, I, I, wait a second. This, oh, come on. So this is actually the order content. Let's name it like this. This is the user content, user content. And then look what we should do in the exporter, pass this, comma, order content. OK, and then four dots, this is the point, you will reference the function which will actually get to write the content. Right? This is the thing that needs to be done here. So basically, you will pass in the missing functionality, how to write the content in this particular case using an order content writer or an, an, a user's content writer. I, I, you get the point. May, I may have still some typos here, but you get the big picture, right? I'm just passing in the missing function uh, that I take from another instance, for example, this case. But now I have the same issue. This has this, yeah. IO exception. What can we do about this? We saw one solution with TriCatch. We also saw the unchecked stuff. I won't repeat myself. I would just like you all to close your eyes. <laughs> I'm kidding, right? I, I will not say anything. Just <laughs> silently. Shh. You didn't see anything happening, OK? We are all fine. But what's this? Right content. Why is it throwing? Oops. You shouldn't be. I, I think I put, I've put a wrong I, uh, sneaky throws. Oh my god, I've, I've mentioned it. OK. Oh my god. What, just, what, this, what this does really is from Lombok, of course. It's magic in code. What this does is silently swallows your own exception in brackets in a, in, a, in a runtime exception instead, right? Good. But to get the point, you are, using, you are passing in the missing functionality. But there is more to this pattern, really. There is this discussion very nicely. I want you to think. Now, in this scenario, with using these two classes that, we, that you, you see, I want you to think, how would you test each of them? Imagine, to test this one, you will just pass in here a string writer, right? You will write all the content in, in memory in some string writer, no files involved. You will just take the string out of that string writer and assert how, it's, how, it's, how it was done very nicely, without any infrastructure concerns. Whereas here, you will probably pass some mock, some dummy content writer that just writes X, right? And then test that in isolation. So this really nicely decouples the infrastructure concerns from the more, let's say, business logic or more elevated concerns, more higher level uh, uh, policy, let's say. And I found this to be very nicely if you are doing, I don't know, TDD or if you are trying to cover very, very carefully your code with tests. Does it make sense? OK, so passing a block, it's really this pattern. And um, we will see them all at the end. But I have one more thing to show you. This is um, a derivation, I don't know, uh, extracted yeah, from the famous Kata video store from Uncle Bob. And uh, it goes like this. 
We have this movie class, which has this type. It can be irregular, it can be new release, it can be ch children. And I have this final type inside of it. And compute price based on number of days, I will switch on the type. And in case it's regular, I will return days plus one. In case it's new release, days multiplied by two. And in case it's children, I, I will simply return five, otherwise zero. Zero, free, deducted from your salary, right? Now tell me, what is the thing that annoys you most in this example? <laughs> Of course, of course, how can I? Do, what do you have to do with my salary? Leave my salary alone. Why do you speak about my salary? So, <laughs> what you should do, you should delete the offending line, of course. But this doesn't compile anymore, because, yeah, of course, it's missing some return. So it should, any switch should have a default, of course, which will return minus one, right? No, <laughs> sorry. Throw, where is it? Throw new illegal argument exception. There you go. Very nice. And then you will hope that when you will add a new type here, you will hope to remember to come here and to add a new case. Do you know what is the most used development methodology in the world? Venkat mentioned it several times. GDD, Jesus Driven Development. <laughs> Jesus hope I find everywhere I put that switch, right? So there you go. Um, this is a problem for me, that I might forget to add this other case when I change this enum. But then what can I do? Let me, let, let, let's think. In limited scenarios where it's very simple logic, I would dare to put this lovely method right inside the enum. I know some of you may not agree with that, because this is business logic. What does it have to do with a type? But you know, I like to think of it as type-specific functionality, as functionality which is specific to a certain taxonomy, to a certain uh, uh, yeah, breaking, to a certain, I don't know, type. So then, uh, yeah, enums can have, of course, abstract methods. We all know that. That's, what, that's why we chose Java in the first place. And um, uh, re re I should return from regular here. I should return this. Yeah. This uh, here. Oh, oh, return, return. And then I will return this. Uh, this is multiplied by two, and I'll return here directly five. Nice. Good. And now, what's the advantage of this approach is that in uh, the code looks like this. Return type dot compute price based on days and period. This means that if I delete this, I will also delete the illegal argument exception, which is perfectly fine because it's impossible now to add here a new uh, a new uh, type, a new value without adding the missing function. It's red, right? I like it. It's, it's red. So I will have to provide an implementation, which is good. Right? <laughs> Again, I agree. If this bit of logic starts to grow too big, it's no place for it to be in an enum. In which case, and, and there, are, there is one more particular case. What if the business decides that this tool needs to be ta taken from the database, that they want to adjust that factor later on? What would you do? Well, I'll tell you for, for sure, you can't inject anything here, right? You can do auto-wired, I don't know, something here. It won't work. This is an entity, right? Okay. So then, what do you do? Well, let's see. So you start with an interface new release price repo, which will get the factor from that silly two, right? That silly two. Then I have price service. This private final new release price repository, this dependency. In compute new release price, I will get the days in and return days multiplied by repo get factor. You get the point? I get, I'm getting it from the database. And then compute regular price based on days will return days plus one as usual, and compute children price will return, of course, five, thank you, and then public in compute price based on number of movie types and number of days will switch type. And then in case I'm in regular, I will return compute regular price based on number of days, right? In case I'm in new release, I will just return, uh, return compute new release price, something like that. Okay, in case I am in children, I will return compute children price. Oops, one cup, what the heck is this? Compute children price of days. Of course, and I'm done, right? Uh, basically, well, not quite. This needs a cast here, okay, and then this will, this is missing again the, the, the return, right? So we know how to fix this default, throw. New, but as we type this, we think, oh my god, I'm putting here an exception uh, with one word in mind, right? 
And we, 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 we know that and we think, oh my God, what, 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 what am I doing? Wait, wait, I was, I was trying to avoid that, right? Okay, so then what do you do? First of all, we, let's clean this up a bit. Okay, like this, how is it in, like this, okay? And then let's, I will not have any more methods there, but instead I will have a horrible thing. Now, I would like to excuse, to excuse me for the things that I will write in the following, I don't know, five minutes, let's say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, public, final, by function, oh my god, by function, taking as the first parameter the price service, the second parameter is actually the thing that gets into the method, which is an integer, and returns back an integer, which is the price algorithm. Oh my god, what the heck is this? I will take it to the constructor, of course. I'll import the B function, and then comes the, the, the beautiful part. So, uh, folks, again, let's, let's understand what we are trying to achieve, first of all. The, uh, the logic to calculate the price for certain types of movie now just went into this price service, right? So I would like now, somehow, to be able to, to link the enum values with the various implementation of these uh, algorithms. And I can do that. How? Here, if I type price service four dots this, this will, and this is a, this is a tricky part, r really. I am referencing an instance method by giving it, by taking the reference from the class thing. This means that from this, actually this reference is a B function that takes as the first parameter the instance that uh, this method needs to be called upon. So this is how this works, and compute new, oh, I, f I messed it up. This is, okay, let's, oh, come on. Uh, here, nope, nope, not again. Compute regular price, good. And then in case we are in children, we could compute the children price. Compute the children price, children price, children price. I'm using Eclipse, I know. Okay, so then, uh, the point is the following. So let's suppose this is a service, a full-fledged service, that I can gen out a wire with spring stuff. Okay, then here, this switch, as before, I will try to replace with what we've done just now. So I will start with type. I will take the price algorithm, and then I will apply. The first parameter is the instance on which it must be invoked, which is this. The second is the parameter, the actual parameter, which is days. And I will simply return this again. This no longer needs any illegal argument exception here to be thrown, because this is type safe. You cannot possibly, this is nonsense here, you cannot possibly add a new value to this enum elders. It won't work, it won't compile. It will ask you to give it a reference. And what would you do? You will come here probably, or at least you will have a warning sign at compile time that you might be, miss, you might be forgetting to, in, to, to implement uh, uh, something. People said here that, okay, someone could pass null here. Yes, they could, but come on. I don't see often developers very comfortable typing n, u, l, l. This is not something you usually do and feel comfortable about that, right? So this is why I'm more confident that this is better than just hunting for the switches where I've put. Now, um, okay, this really works. Let's try. Uh, first of all, I need to invoke, the, I need to, to construct the new price service, I think it's called, yes. The repository here, I need a repository. This repository, I will simply mock away with new release price repository. Okay, class, and then I will repo, I will when this, when, when, this repo factor, uh, then return, return, then, uh, import, come on, yes, I'm using Eclipse, then return uh, 2D, okay, and then this uh, service that I have here, I will use, actually, let me, yeah, uh, price service dot, um, compute price. Ah, ha, ha. Compute price. Okay. And then we need this type as the first parameter, and the second parameter to be the number of days that I am uh, 
borrowing the time renting this movie. Good. And this runs. And it gives me 345. Nicely. So, how this really happens, I'm, I'm, I'm going here, really, in this compute price. This, based on the type that I provide, gets me back the function that I need to call. And this is weird, in a, in a sense, because from here I get to the enum, and from the enum I get it back here. But so there is a price to pay. But the advantage is that you can never forget to provide the missing logic, the, the bit of logic that you have to put there, right? Good. Now, uh, this was about it. Now let's draw some conclusions here, right? Um, what we've really done is we've tried to take the clean code rules and to apply them when, uh, when we jump on Java 8 syntax. What we've seen, so many people say that clean code is all about expressive, suggestive names. In this context, a lambda is an anonymous function. So, you can imagine I have a problem with a lambda, especially a big one like that, that starts with an arrow and then a bracket and then pours 10 lines of code. I don't like that. Any bit of, any, any chunk of, of, of lines needs a method. So what I, what I tell you is lambdas should be just one liners, should not start with a block and pour code there. That's not the way to go. If you search my code base, you will not find any occurrence of that token. Arrow and then bracket. Nothing. Zero. Every time I have a fat lambda, uh, a heavy lambda, I extract it into uh, methods either in the same class, either in some item class, in some constructor, some static method. Whatever you do, put it a name. Right? Then, the clean code said no nullable parameters, because if you ever get a nullable parameter, the first thing you have to do in the function is to check for null. And we've done that, and we've seen how ugly this pollutes our business logic code. If you replace nulls with optionals in, in all the places in your code, this will translate to you should never accept optionals as parameters to your, to your function. Instead of that, we've started from the optional, and we've mapped We've applied the function in just in case there was something inside the box, right? In the same spirit, the function should not return a null. It should, you should throw an exception as soon as possible in case you detect some error condition. Not throw the dead cat in the other's one garden, right? Don't just pass it. Hey, there you go. There's a null. There's a Schrodinger's cat, you know? There you go. It might be null. You, you figure it out. Don't do that. Instead of that, just pass it an optional that you can be, signal your color. There might be nothing here. And this, in particular, is one of the most important points today. Pass an optional, and it, it takes time to, 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 to apply it on your code base. Even in getters, even in getters from your, from your, from your, from your entities. So whenever you have a function which may return nothing, return an optional instead of a null. Right? This is very important. Now, Again, there may be times, as we, as, we, as we had, in which you might wrap multiple times the same thing, right? Just apply flat map and get rid of the extra wrappings, right? Just that. Now, at some point, we wanted to execute arbitrary logic within our function. This happens very often to us. We have this algorithm, and at that point, we want to do this or this. How we can do is to copy-paste programming, is to add a Boolean parameter. We didn't even do that. But you can imagine, if I'm exporting users, do that. Else, do the other stuff. This is ugly. This is even worse, right? The, I think it's worse than, than copy-pasting, really. Then extract and override, and we've done that. Template method, and we today are, um, are, witness, are witnessing the funeral of template method, I might say. Because with, 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 with passing a block that Java 8 allows us so nicely to do, the, the whole template method idea doesn't make any sense anymore. You will just pass the missing function. There are some limited cases, of course. It depends. But 95% of the cases, you just have one missing bit of logic that you can safely pass as a, as a method argument. Uh, however, the example we saw it's really, it's really more than that, because if you look careful at this, uh, the, the, this code, we are creating the, the writer, we are passing in the writer, and then we are closing and catching exceptions about that writer. So this, what really happens is that the content writer is loaned an instance of the writer which it does not manage. The f real export format does not care about creating files, IO exceptions, doesn't care about that. Right? Just write the darn format. Right. And this decouples very nicely the things for testing. You can very easily test each of the parts in isolation. And I like that a lot. 
Good. Uh, by the way, we had this in place years already. In GDBC template, you had that row mapper, right? And we, you pass the row mapper. How many of you know about the row mapper? About the GDBC template? Okay, Ever, almost okay, half of you. So the point was you just passed in the row mapper and which converted the result set that you did not close or manage or create. You just given a result set. It's very nicely. It lowers the burden on your reader. Another form of this is in case you already have some bit of logic, for example, save page, and you just want to measure how much time this took. And you, you a sort of aspect, I don't know, it's not very uh, correct what I'm saying, but a sort of weaving another function around it, right, to measure the time. You know, t0 equals, t1 equals, print out t1 minus t0. Or in case you suddenly want to save your request in a transaction, okay? Besides a transactional, we can still do that, right? Execute that in a, transa in a transaction. It's an ad hoc proxy, I might say. Good, but then we, um, we stumbled upon a checked exception. And we, this is good, right? Because clean code says to prefer runtime exceptions. I'm not talking about frameworks here, I'm talking about your own business logic code. You don't want to couple your code with checked exception. You want to throw runtime and don't care about them anymore, right? Now. Not accidentally, Java 8 standard functional interfaces don't throw anything. So you will have a hard time if you want to work with checked exception, which is good. My point here is to re-throw checked exception as, as fast as possible if you are trying to use Java 8, because it will make your life easier. You can try libraries, you build your own little functions, or I don't know, Lombo. <laughs> I don't know. Good. Then at the end, we, we very rapidly we skimmed over type-specific logic, how we can implement it in multiple ways. First was the switch. And uh, yeah, this will get us to the switch, switch hunt day, right? Where did I put my switches? Oh my god, where did I switch on this? It's painful, it's dangerous. However, we must say the switch are the simplest of all. Because especially if you follow these rules, I personally follow these rules every time. So the switch is the only instruction in a method, the first and only instruction, and every of its cases directly return as, as uh, whenever possible, right? Whenever possible, directly return. And not, not accidentally, this is, the way, this is one way Java could go to. If you know about that JEP, uh, GAP proposal to have switch as expressions, not statements, we could, ha we could have Scala switches in Java at, in a certain amount of years. But this is a way that Java could go to. Then OOP, we didn't even cover that. The traditional kata went on having the movie with subtypes for each of the specific types, I mean subclassing there. But this is, yeah, I don't know. It's maybe too, com it's too dangerous. It's, a, it's too much of a, of a statement. It's too tough to start with, really. What we've seen instead, we've seen that you can put small bits of lo logic inside in the methods, or we can reference some other methods in case those methods grow too big, pull them away in another place, and use dependencies, whatever you want there. And I would like to finish with the manifesto for not only object-oriented development. How about this one? I did not invent this, I just found it. Look, functions and types over classes. Purity. Pure functions, no side effects, over mutability. Composition, over inheritance, that's an old principle, actually. Higher order functions, over method dispatch, you know? Give me that, I'll give that back to you. Uh, so higher order functions, and optionals over nulls, right? Think about how you can, don't use functional programming everywhere. This is not the way, but learn to balance OOP and functional programming for your needs. Now, that was all, folks. Now. It was, uh, how many of you think it, that this was all too fast? Raise your hand. How many th honestly think this was, oh, oh, good, nice. Uh, the point is, I wrote an article about this. On this own, you can read it slowly afterwards. It was all recorded. And I'll be more than delighted to have a chat with you after, after this talk. On the website, you can have, you will find trainings, uh, talks, goodies, other things you can download. And do follow me, I post loads of quality stuff each day, right? Each day, two, one or two posts, interesting. But the best part is this, I brought you all stickers, yes! Because in IT, culture is based on stickers. So I brought you all stickers, and in case there are technical leads here, I have an extra present for you guys. So come forward and take your sticker, but please do take just one. I brought several hundreds, but you are 
a bit more than several hundreds, I think. So I invite you all here to take your sticker and brag with it, right? Good. Thank you all, folks. That was all for today. Thanks. <laughs>